Hello WCA, Mike Amore. Welcome to the week two video. I'm going to show you little snippets, I like saying the word snippet, from the um, from a master game. And you're not going to see the entire game, but you are going to see clips um, with the idea of teaching you about imbalances and a couple of other uh, words or, or names for maneuvers or concepts in chess. So the first one I want to talk about is how to create an imbalance. Well, I guess you need to know what an imbalance is first. It's basically any difference in your position than mine. For example, if your pawn structure is different, if you have more control over a certain file or diagonal, are your minor pieces different? Do you have more material? Do you have a little bit of more control of the game? They call that initiative, right? So watch this. This is a completely symmetrical, boring position. But look at knight a4. What's the object? Well, in the game, black tucks the bishop in because you can't really save the bishop from the knight. It's going to get chased around. And we make an exchange on b6. Black captures toward the center. Two imbalances now exist. You see what they are? One, the pawn structure is different because of the trade. There are doubled B pawns, which means the rook up here has come to life for black. And white has different minor pieces. White has two bishops and a knight. Black has two bishops. I'm sorry, two knights and a bishop. Does that matter? It sure does. It matters a lot. White is probably going to look to open the game at some point for his bishops. And black is going to say, hey, you know, I'm going to put my knights on squares that are really strong and kind of make your bishops look silly. Who's going to win? Whoever understands the structure better. Okay, you guys got that? How that happened? Here was the, here was the move. Completely symmetrical. Knight a4 going after the bishop pair. And after the trades, we have this position with two changes in uh, imbalances. Structure and minor pieces. Okay? All right. Now, let's go to clip number or snippet number two. Okay, here, this is a little further down the line. In this position, black found a really nice way to break the pin. You see the pin I'm talking about? This can be really, really annoying. So rather than let the bishop take the knight and damage the structure in front of the king, black plays queen e7. Their idea was, well, white played rook e1. The idea was to make the trade on c4. And after the trade, play the move queen e6. And the idea of that trade was to get the queen off of this diagonal, but at the same time, uh, in case the bishop ever does take the knight, the queen has the option of taking back without damaging the structure. Okay, you guys see that idea? Let's go back. It's in this position, black to play. So when they played queen e7, it wasn't just to connect the rooks at the top of the board, which of course is not bad, but it's a little bit deeper. They were planning to make an exchange. Rook came here, bishop took, knight took. Got it? Queen e6. Very good. So here comes, from the same position, a move that some students see it and go, are you kidding? I call it the no babysitting rule. And it's pawn a3. You guys know why white put the pawn on a3? No babysitting, man. Yeah, there's a really powerful rook here on a8. And that rook is bearing down on the a file. If you just randomly move this rook, the a pawn's going to fall. So by playing a3, it's called a prophylactic move. And that keeps the rook from stealing the pawn. Hey, listen carefully. My T's ready. Can you hear that? The T is actually delicious. Okay, clip number three, I think. Ready? It's white to play. You remember the imbalances we talked about earlier? Look at the minor pieces, right? In this position, a pair of knights against a knight and a bishop. So the, the, the light square bishops came off the board before. White is the only one with a bishop. So when that happens, very often the game wants to open. Open. What do you think white played? Come on, everybody. D4. Open the game. E takes. Rook takes. 
The only thing you would have to be careful about with a move like this is the rook that just took on, on d4 is loose. It's not protected. But there are really no tactical chances to get this rook. But in the future, please keep an eye on that. Make sure you don't miss something, okay? Let's go back to the clip to make sure you understand how we got here. It's uh, white to play. There's the pawn break. And again, a pawn break is when two pawns are bumping heads. That's called a pawn wedge. And you attack the wedge from the side. Should you break every chance you get? Absolutely not. Why is white breaking? To try to activate the bishop. Put it back. What's the bishop doing on g3? It's hitting a brick wall. After the trade, you can see the bishop starts to open up a little bit. Rook takes. Okay, very good. Same game, my friends. I'm just not showing you every move. Same game. Here, white has an option to move their rook. It's being attacked. You guys see the knight on c4 attacking, attacking the rook or make the exchange. Here, white decides to make the exchange because in their mind, they have a way to continue improving this bishop. Okay, so pause the video. Um, look at it again. It's white to play. White decided to make the trade in order to help this bishop. Figure it out. Knight takes, queen takes, and e5. What do you do? The pawn's being attacked. Uh, you know, you, if you push it, you have to watch out. The queen doesn't get harassed. The pawn could get attacked. The pawn could push further and open up squares around the king. So black decides to take. Bishop takes. How many center pawns are on the board? Zero. That's one less than one. Zero. You guys see what happened to the bishop? It improved itself. Go back. Now, there's an absolutely, I think the, the, the player with white is 2,400. I mean, that's pretty strong, right? So let's just go back to when he decided to make the trade. It's here. You're playing white. It's not hard to calculate. You can see that knight takes knight is going to be followed by queen takes knight. Well, why not just keep pushing forward? E5. Open the game. Push. Take. Take. The knight attacks the bishop. The bishop is protected. Should you give up the bishop? Let the knight trade itself? Uh-uh. Where do you put it? Bishop to c3. No trading. Okay? No trading in that position. Very good. This position I like a lot. Um, again, same games. You, you, you have here a case where white move their h-pawn. And they didn't just move it to make an escape square. They made a super escape square. They moved it two boxes. And the reason it went two boxes is, number one, you can't really comfortably attack this rook, which means you can't remove the defender. You know, imagine if the queen's not there and you can play c5, then the rook would be forced to stay on this line to protect the pawn. But that's not the case here. Um, another problem for black is, what if this pawn reaches h5? Um, it's going to kick the knight, actually, and it's going to make a wedge near the king up there. Okay, so you guys see that's just a cool move. So you go back, you're playing the white pieces, you're not sure what to do. Sometimes you're going to see these players push the h-pawn, and in this case, they move it two squares. What do you get for it? You get some space, you get the potential to attack, and also uh, a super escape square, because you can get out like even further if you needed to, Okay. All right, that's, that's what happened there. Very exciting, I know. So here comes a critical part of the game. Black just blundered. They put their queen underneath the knight. You guys see anything in this position that white should do? And I was kind of surprised that white missed this as a 2400. Yeah, white should just put the rook underneath and all the tactics favor black. That's uh, for white. That's a real nasty pin. Um, all sorts of moves. F4, a lot of things are being threatened here. Uh, but for some reason, white just missed it and played rook to d5, and that was followed by f6, supporting the knight. Now here, very important moment of the game. In this position, white, who held on to this bishop for so long, was trying to fight against the knight because they say that 
if you have pawns on both sides of the board, the bishop can eventually outplay a knight, or sometimes can. Here, white did something very interesting. They purposely went for the trade because he knows that you can't take with the queen. There's, there's a rook here. He knows that by trading the minor piece imbalance, bishop for knight, those are different pieces, what did he get in return? He got a very, very weak pawn. So what black uh, has to deal with is this pawn, which is going to get attacked from the front and from the side. Um, it could be an issue later in the game. Okay, so that's why they gave up the bishop. It's called trading one advantage for another. Okay, on to this clip. Got a little bit later down in the game. Here, white just played queen g4. You guys see the threat? Mate in one. That's why I always tell students, watch the pawn wedges near the king. They can be deadly. If that queen gets to g6, game is finished. Black did not like that and offered white a queen trade because it, it also counterattacks the f2 square. You guys see that down there, right? So now the question is, do you trade the queens? And if you do trade the queens, why? Because if they come off the board, you're going to be in a rook ending. Let me show you what I mean. Queen takes, if you make this trade, rook takes. Now this is an end game. And our definition at the WCA of an endgame is any position where the primary purpose is to promote a pawn. It would be your move in this position is white. Would you go for this endgame or not? Keep in mind that your pawn is being attacked here. Okay, let's see what you come up with. Stop your video. Here's the position. Do you trade queens? Okay, white went for it. Because after the trade, they put a rook on d7. And if you compare the two rooks, the white rook is a little bit more active. There was a trade here and a trade here. Okay, white is a little bit better in this position. Not winning yet, but just clearly the rook is a little bit more active attacking those pawns. Okay, a little further down the road. White just made a trade on b5. And black has two ways to take back. See the pawn here? You can take with the rook over here on the side, or you can take with the pawn. Which one and why? Stop the video. Okay, I hope you said the pawn, because if you take with the rook, you're done. This is called going all in. After the rooks come off the board, you're in a king and pawn ending. There's nothing left after that, man. It's the king and the pawns. There, there's no middle game. There's no opening trap. It's pure calculation, and you're going to get in trouble because white is simply going to make a passed pawn. Let's say you get your king in the game is black. And after a4, what do you do? I mean, you can take or push. It doesn't really matter. Actually, you probably should take because, I don't know, that, that pawn's going to fly up the board anyway. I mean, what do you do? How are you going to stop that thing? Even if you had time to get your king over, um, you know, it, even if you could, you're not going to be able to save this pawn and the other king's going to get in. But you're lost here. You can't allow this outside pass pawn. You, you, you're not going to catch it. You guys see that? So back here, you have to um, you have to take with, um, with the pawn. Okay? Yeah, very important. Final position. Really nice endgame technique. There's a pawn being attacked by the rook up here on a8 and white decides not to protect it and plays the move rook to d2 allowing rook takes pawn check followed by king g4 do you know what black did in this position black actually resigned because this is a theoretical position um if you were going to play this out for example if you if you put your rook in the top the pawn's going to push, and you can try to now get underneath the king. The king's going to march up. The main thing to see here, my friends, is the fact that, I'll put some highlights on for you, the black king is cut out. Um, you check the king. He's going to hide behind the pawn, and eventually, you know, king c7, look again. He can't get through. The white king will just push himself up the board. It doesn't matter where you're going with that rook because the pawn's just going to push. You can go back to g1, king f8. What can you do with black? The pawn just marches forward. And then at the right moment, rook e2. 
and you'll see the black king is like miles away. You just bring your king out and make a queen. Okay, so there's a couple of examples from the same game talking about some imbalances. I hope you understood everything I showed. I, I tried not to make it too complicated, but I did want you uh, all to pick up the language and the ideas. All right. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms. We'll see you in uh, two weeks.